Well, thank you to the praise team. Wonderful worship this morning. We have um, we've had so far, and now we get an opportunity to look at uh, the, the Word of God today. And I'm I'm always excited about that. Uh, let me start by uh, recalling a story. I, I'd gone to my <clears throat> very first congregation. It was out in the uh, Shenandoah Valley. It was in Verona near Stanton as as pastor and. Um, it was a good, great church, very low conflict, enjoyed it there. Uh, we grew, it was great worship. One thing that we did in the first three or four years I was there is that we had to do some renovation of the sanctuary, and um, we had uh, had to change. Um, everything was like this really beautiful natural wood, but it was just decaying so much, the uh, team decided they had to paint it. It just wasn't worth redoing, so... We painted it, painted it all white, and kind of looked like this after that, you know, with your windowsills and all. And so, with that, it, uh, we had done that for a couple of weeks, been worshiping. I uh, got a, no- a knock on the parsonage door. I lived in the parsonage then, a little country church. And, um, and it was one of our, our dear ladies, and um, she came in, and she just sat down, and she was so distraught, and I think her name was Dot. I said, Dot, what is the matter? And she said... I just got to let you know, I just don't think I can continue to come and worship and, and be at the church. And I said, well, what's the problem? What's going on? And she said, I don't know, every time I get in there and sit down and I look at those white walls, I just get so angry. I just, I just, uh, I just don't think I can keep coming. We changed the color of that sanctuary, and I just, I just can't stand it. She was again it. And um, it reminded me, that was our first experience, how... And since in my in my ministry years, I have I haven't heard them all, but I have heard some uh, far more what I think are silly reasons of people not wanting to attend church anymore, not wanting to worship God because some kind of change has happened within the congregation or a change in tradition. To her, that was a deep tradition for some reason, seeing the natural color uh, in that sanctuary, and she just could not get over it. Now, we're going to see Jesus this morning speak to the issue of, um, of, of holding on to our traditions, and also he's going to talk about how we can be truly cleansed from within, from from vices and ourselves, and and I think that I think both of these kind of of go together of where our priorities are. We just read the passage, and and as it begins, you know, we see that um, the Pharisees and scribes. Now in Mark, we they, you know, they they've been introduced a little bit, but they're going to come to the forefront a little bit more in this gospel. That they are really going to be the ones that oppose Jesus and his radical views of a new kingdom of God. And uh, it's almost, uh, Mark almost paints the picture that these scribes and Pharisees are like, you know, little CIA agents. You know, they're, they're following Jesus around, spying on him, waiting for him to mess up. And uh, I remember saying, or reading or saying one time that, um, you know, if, we ever, if you ever doubted that Jesus never sinned, we would know about it because these scribes and Pharisees would have, would have somehow as spies discovered him in some corner or in some moment away from the crowd that he would have done it. But they're spying on him. They observe that the disciples aren't properly washing their hands. And um, Mark goes on to explain that, that part of tradition was that you just ceremonially washed your hands, you scrubbed the pots and pans before you ate, uh, and that was just what you did. Probably nobody remembered why you did it, but it was a law that was done hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and you were supposed to do it. And one of the things that Jesus says in response of this is that, and we need to learn and hear this today, is that many of our church traditions, many of our Christian traditions, maybe even many of your personal faith traditions Traditions are mostly always man-made. They're not God-ordained. There are no God traditions in Scripture. Scripture just talks about God laws. (laughs) 
uh, what God wants us to do, how God wants us to live, how God wants us to relate to him. There are no set traditions, and we'll see that later as far as salvation or how to be forgiven and cleansed. There's nothing we can do but have a relationship with the Father. So the first thing to remember in Jesus' response, he's trying to get across to us, traditions are man-made. Grace and love and relationship is God-ordained. It's a big difference. Now, we, um, in looking at traditions and getting stuck in them, one, I think the big picture is, is that we have to guard because of this. We need as Christians to guard our spiritual vision. And what I mean by this is that if we get too stuck in our traditions, if we get too stuck in how we do everything or how you're comfortable it, to make sure you're comfortable when you come to church or you're comfortable when you live out your Christian faith amidst your family and your friends because you can only do this one way, we kind of, our spiritual vision becomes myopic. It becomes tunnel vision. It almost becomes maybe like we have cataracts spiritually. We can't see. We lose the ability to see clearly. And when we hold on to traditions so much, we become blinded many times to the authentic work of God that's going on around us. God is always working around us. God is always ready to do new things. God is always showing us the direction to go in your personal walk, in your walk as a church. And one thing that keeps us from seeing the great things that God is doing and wants us to do is that we can get stuck on our traditions. This is exactly what's happening with the Pharisees and scribes, isn't it? You know, you, you know, no, we can't, uh, we can't see this new kingdom, this great teaching, this great healing, this new way of knowing God that Jesus is bringing in because we're stuck on the disciples and him aren't washing their hands properly before they eat. That's more important. And you can sit there, you can think of your traditions, right, can't you? You can think of those things that keep you from seeing with spiritual, godlike visions. And churches all over America, things that, that churches and individuals hold on to, you know, things like worship styles. You know, they're, you know, Fairview's not immune. No, many churches, most churches in America today aren't, you know. Boy, if I, if I can't sing the songs I like to, worship like I like to, man, I just can't meet God. That's not what the Bible says, <laughs> is it? God is here. God's in your heart. Um, maybe it's uh, something as simple as um, sitting in the same pew on Sunday. Let me look around. Yep, yep. All right, we're all kind of doing that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I see a funny cartoon every now and then. It'll pop up in some religious uh, uh, periodicals, you know. It's, uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, I think it's a picture of um, uh, a couple uh, that's been in the church a long time, and they're, they're, look, they're, they're coming down the aisle. They're kind of looking at these people sitting in the pew, and I think the caption is, um, all, the, all the congregation held their breath as someone, as visitors came and sat in Mr. and Ms. Smith's pew. <laughs> they're going to see what Mr. and Ms. Smith did. That's tradition, isn't it, that we just become habit-forming. Um, maybe we hold on to programs or things that we do just because we've always done them. Just because we've always done them. Uh, we become comfortable in our current Sunday school classes or we become comfortable in our current small groups. We love the fellowship we have each other, but we stop thinking about or we never take five or ten minutes of every class to say, what can we do to invite and reach new people? What can we do to enlarge this class for the kingdom? We're more comfortable in who's showing up and, you know, telling our story, seeing what's happened from Sunday to Saturday. But we lose the God vision of these groups need to be open and we need to strategize on how we can be welcoming and even invite new people in. Um, so what does your mind's eye pick out first when there's talk of change, when there's talk of newness, when 
when you see new people or, or new people invade your ranks and make you feel a little uncomfortable. Who are these new people? What do they think? You know, gosh, you know, that's a little bit different personality than we're used to. I got to get used to that. What, you know, how, what is your vision? Is it myopic from tradition or from sameness? Or can you have a godlike vision? Do you, do you pick up not in personal comfort, your eye doesn't go, but it goes right to the work of God. It goes right to, boy, this could be God speaking to us, sharing with us, giving us a new vision. Someone once said the scribes and the Pharisees had, had gone far from the real command of God. Let's say one command of God is in Psalm 29 two: Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's God's vision and tradition, right? Isn't that beautiful? Worship the Lord God in the beauty of holiness. And they had changed it. No, make sure you wash your hands and scrub the dishes. You know, whose vision's better? <laughs> whose long-time eternal tradition and outlook is better? And we can, we can change scrub the dishes and wash the pots and pans to anything you want to. But the eternal vision is worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's the the dichotomy of what, of what Jesus is trying to tell us. So I think the first challenge is, is let we at, at Fairview guard against missing out on God's blessings, missing out on the great work in our midst because we're too busy being caretakers. We're too busy being watchdogs of our tradition. Let's open up and have a godlike vision for what's going to happen. And let's remember as individuals and, and church that, that no one can maintain a relationship with God by merely keeping rules, regulations, and traditions. You cannot maintain, your, you can't grow in your relationship. You're not going to deepen your discipleship by just following your traditions and doing the same thing week after week after week. It may feel good but you're not going to deepen your walk with God. And that's the second half of the scripture passage. So Jesus talks about this, and then he gives a new way. He gives the Jesus way of thinking about how do we, all of these rules and traditions, and that's exactly how the, the scribes and the Pharisees, that was their purpose. If you do all of these things, you'll be clean. You, and they're saying, do all these things on the outside, all these go through all these motions, and that will clean you up inside. Jesus says, no, that's not the Jesus way. That's not the new kingdom of God way. And near the end of the passage, he even tells the disciples, right, are you so dull? And they ask him about it. That's pretty blunt, wasn't it? I'll, I'll try never to say that to you. <laughs> are you so dull? <laughs> um, that um, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? Jesus expounds on the true way to view tradition and man-made religious rules and laws. And basically what he says is, first of all, and this is good news, okay? There's no outward source. There's no behavior. There's no vice that you have. There's no sin that you're involved with or just are just struggling uh, to get over that cannot be forgiven by God through Jesus Christ. Now, that's good news. That's good news of the gospel, right? We can be forgiven. We can be changed. We can be cleansed. We can't hear that enough. And it's what comes out of a person's heart that really reveals their true relationship with God. Jesus later, over in John, John will put it in Jesus' words, I think it's that 15th chapter, about fruit, won't he? That if we love God, if we have that true relationship with God, then our lives will bear fruit. Paul expounds on that in Galatians, doesn't he? That fifth chapter, near the end of the chapter, he even tells, says what that fruit is, doesn't he? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. And he says, against these things, there is no law. There is no tradition. That's what Jesus is talking about here. 
that there's no magic words, there's no behavior, there's no program, there's no religious membership that can take care of the sin that resides in your heart. It's got to be a Jesus thing. Max Lucado gives a great illustration that I read from this passage. And he said that uh, his family went on vacation. He was to go in and, um, and unplug, I think, the, the toaster before they left. You know, you know, everybody thinks about that. So he ran in, he unplugged it. He got back and realized he had unmistakably, or he had mistakenly unplugged the freezer oh. <clears throat> after a two-week vacation. We all know what he meant, right? So he said, you know, he looked at his wife. They had a family meeting, and guess who was in charge of cleaning up the freezer? He was. He unplugged it. It was his problem. So he said, okay, what do I do? So now he gets a little um, ridiculous here. But he said, uh, what's the best way to clean out this rotten interior? So he said, he, he knew what he said. First, he got out a rag and some heavy-duty cleaner, and he just scrubbed and shined the outside of that freezer. He said it was in military order. It, it, you could just see your face in it. And he cleaned it all up, and he opened the door, and the smell was revolting. But he closed it up real quick. And then he said, no problem. He said, well, I think what this freezer needs is just some more friends to make it feel better. So he said he threw a party for the freezer, and he moved all the other kitchen appliances in the house close to it so it could feel good about each other. And he even invited some of the other neighbors to bring their appliances over. And he said, you know, toasters reunited. They were in the store together, but now they were together. And, and you know, everybody was happy, and, and the freezer had all kinds of friends around them. And um, then he said they all left, and he, he put the other appliances up. He said he opened up the freezer, and boy, it stank even more. And he said, well, uh, maybe if I cleaning up the freezer wouldn't work, I'll give it some status. So he went out, he put a, um, a, Mercer, a Mercedes sticker on it. And um, he painted a paisley tie down the middle of it. He, um, he slapped a Save the Whales sticker on it. So it was politically correct and uh, just did everything he could for good measure. But when he opened the freezer up, you know, it was really putrid. Okay, you get the idea. The problem was not on the outside of the freezer, was it? The inside needed to be cleaned out. And that's what we need to learn. That's what Jesus is trying to tell us about how we try to solve all of our religious issues, our personal issues, our sin issues from the outside by keeping up good looks and tradition. But we cannot solve our internal soul problems by dressing up our outside. You're not going to save it by getting a new job. You're not going to change from the inside by buying a new house, a new car, by going on an expensive vacation, by, having a, by being on a travel sports team, by getting lost in a hobby or a craft, by giving up all your energy rooting for your favorite sports team. None of that is going to clean up the inside of your life, is it? Jesus said that we need a clean heart Jesus says we need a new start. Jesus says we need forgiveness. And Jesus goes on, and Mark and the Gospels go on to share with us that only Jesus can provide that through dying on the cross for our sin and through being raised from the dead. So we can try a lot of things. We can keep doing the same things in our life. But until we learn that and go to the Lord, nothing is really going to change on the inside. The freezer is still going to stink, I'm afraid. And that's what uh, this passage this reminds us of. And another commandment that Jesus would give right before he went to the cross, that's what I think it makes it so much more meaningful and goes together, is um, that... Uh, that that's what communion's about, isn't it? It reminds us 
through a very um, uh, tangible symbol of a simple little wafer and, a, and dipping it into the cup or drinking from the cup. We, we put things into our body, but what we're symbolizing is, is that we as Christians have asked Jesus to come inside of us. That when we prayed, when we prayed for Christ to forgive us of our sin, we remembered what he did for us on the cross and through the resurrection. And that the reason that, that we can be clean inside, the reason we can have a, a good uh, a self-image, the reason we can feel forgiven and clean when we go to Jesus, and we'll sing in just a little bit after communion, good, good Father, because uh, it's Jesus. Communion reminds us that Jesus is the one that does that. That's what we need to take in on the inside, Christ, and Christ stays there. And so in just a, just a minute, um, we are going to uh, observe communion once again by coming up and taking the bread and and, and the juice, and remembering what Christ has done for us. And what I want you to do as you take communion is as you come and, or maybe as you go back and sit down, just uh, pray and, and thank Jesus. Ask for forgiveness of your sin once again. And say, so Jesus, you know, I know you cleansed me. Let, let me feel cleansed. Let me feel forgiven. Let me feel like a new person. Thank you for reminding me today through what I've sang and what you've taught me through your word and, and um, what you've, you've left for me in, in the bread and the cup. Let that remind me. And let me walk from this. Wouldn't it be great to walk from this place into our next place you're going to feel clean from the inside? The freezer is going to be, we're, gonna, we're going to defrost the freezer. <laughs> we're going to take out all the junk and the smelly stuff. And we're going to leave fresh, fresh in the spirit of God. So let me pray for you. And I'm going to ask those I asked to help with communion to come up. And then um, we'll, we'll uh, begin our time of communion. And, um, and let's, um, let's just uh, rejoice and be clean in the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for, um, uh, for coming and, and why you lived on earth um, you, you taught us this deep spiritual lesson. Lord, thank you for following through with that and, and God just uh, dying on the cross for our sin, rising from the dead that, that we may have eternal forgiveness and eternal life. And Lord, for the elements that you have left us with to remind us of this great act, the bread, the cup, uh, let us enter this time as a holy moment. Let us enter this time and leave this place cleansed in you. Lord, we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.